All right, guys, welcome to our fourth review session here. I think we got about two more of these left. Final at the end of the year. All right, so um, we're going to be looking at quadratics and radical functions today. Um, we started quadratics last time as well, but today we're looking at the vertex form. Um, whenever you're dealing with quadratics that are in vertex form, they look like this. Where the H and the K make up your vertex. And the A... Uh, basically tells you whether it's a happy face or a sad face. So um, if A is a positive number, then you have an upwards facing parabola. And if A is a negative number, you have a downward facing parabola. So when we're graphing them in this form, we can see that my H is 1 and my K is negative 3. Remember, we always change the sign of the number for H, but we do not do that for the K. So it's positive 1 and negative 3. You'll notice that my A, there's no number there, but we can assume that's a 1. My A is a negative 1, so it's a sad face parabola. So if I wanted to graph that, I would go plotting that point, which is over 1 and down 3. And then I would just draw a sad face parabola there. So that would be the graph of that quadratic. <clears throat> Move on to another question here. And we'll go ahead and take a look at another one. Similar type of question. So uh, for this particular problem, my H is negative 3. My K is also negative 3. My H, opposite sign though, right? And there's my K. Don't sign, keep it as it is. And my A is a positive, so this one's a happy face parabola. So if I was graphing this, I would go, over three to the left and down three. A little parabola. That's the end of that one. All right, next we're going to um, change the quadratic equation below into vertex form by completing the square. All right, so this process has a lot of steps. Uh, the first step is to Matter of fact, I wonder if I'll just kind of type these steps out really quick. The, the first step is going to be to um, add the C to the other side. That would be, in this case, the 10. So you're going to add the 10 over. The next thing you're going to do is you're going to factor out the A. So 4 is the A value, so I'm going to be factoring that out. You're going to do something weird called complete the, completing the square. I'll explain when we get there. Um, but when you complete the square, basically what you end up doing is adding something on both sides of the equation. Sorry, adding, adding a number on one side of the equation so that you get what's called a perfect square trinomial. But since we add a number on one side, we have to add it to the other also. So I call that fix the balance. And then from there... Um, all we should really have to do is factor and simplify, and that should get us there. So there's all of our steps. Um, let's go ahead and put these steps to work for us. So step one is to add the C. So step one is I'm going to add this 10 to the other side. Step two is to factor out the A, that's the four. So I'm gonna divide the four out of the two terms that are on the left side of the equation there. So if I divide that by four, I'm left with X squared. And if I divide that by four, I'm left with two. And now we're going to do the third step, which is a weird one. It's called completing the square. So let's that a little bit. Completing the square means I'm going to add a number here. Now, whenever I do that, the, the purpose of doing that is it's going to turn this trinomial into a perfect square trinomial so that when I factor it, I end up with something like this, x plus a squared, 
um, a trinomial that factors into two identical factors can be written as a square, right? So if this thing factors into two identical things, x plus a, x plus a, then it's x plus a squared, right? So that's kind of the goal there, is we want to be able to factor this thing into um, something that makes two identical factors. Now, the way that we do that is by adding a number here, and that number has to be a very certain number. And that, what that number is, it's always going to be half of this one. So you'll take half of that middle number, which is 1. And then you're going to square it. In other words, multiply it by itself. So what is 1 squared? Or 1 times 1? Well, that would be 1. So that's what we call a perfect square trinomial. Now I'm going to show you guys two ways to do the next step. Well, actually, scratch that. Let's do step four first. The, the step I was thinking of is step five. But um, let's go ahead and do step four. Step four is to fix the balance. Now what I've done is on this left side, I have added a new number in there so that I get a perfect square trinomial. But this is an equation, right? So if you want this side to stay equal to this side, then you need to add something over here also. How do we know what to add? Well, you might think, well, we put a 1 over here, so let's just put a 1 over here. And that's not quite that simple, unfortunately, because the 1 that's in here is actually being multiplied by 4. So you do 4 times 1. So I'll put a little time symbol there. And then you'll add that over here. So 4 times 1 is 4, and that's what we add over here. So I'm actually going to end up adding 4 over there. And so here's what I have now as a result. Right? Okay. Um, the next step that we have is we need to factor this. Now, the long way to factor this would be to use the box method. You put the x squared in the top left, put the 1 in the bottom right, and you look for the two numbers that will end up working. And sure enough, we end up with x plus 1 times x plus 1, which can be written as x plus 1 squared. So this part here is x plus 1 squared. Now, there is a faster way to do this, though. The, the faster way to do this is to do the following. When you factor a perfect square trinomial, there's a neat little thing that you can always be sure of. When you factor a perfect square trinomial, it always turns into a squared binomial where there's an x right here. The only thing that we're not sure about is what number goes here. But that number is actually pretty easy to find. It's always just going to be half of the middle number. So that's going to be 1 plus 1 in this case since it's a plus 2. So there's that. And actually on the steps, I left out a sixth step. So let me write down step 6 here. Um, on step 6, what I forgot to say was move the k over. Now, I'll tell you what I mean by that. Um, this number here is like the k number that we talk about when we're dealing with vertex form. So we actually want to put this thing back over here like that. So here's our final answer. So we changed it from standard form, which is the quadratics we were looking at last week, into vertex form, which is this. These are actually the same exact equation. They're just written in different ways. Um, this one is a lot friendlier to work with a lot of the time than this one. But the problem is that this is how it's usually written. But it is nice to know how to work with them in this way as well when they do pop up. So. That is what we call changing a quadratic into vertex form by completing the square. Um, I'll do one more example like that. Okay, so let's do another one. Um, so first of all, step one is to move the C over to the other side.
The next step is to factor out the A. If I divide that by negative 2, I'm left with x squared. And if I divide that by negative 2, I'm left with minus 6x. Notice that the sign changes because I'm dividing by a negative. The third step is to complete the square. And that's the step where we're going to add a new number in here. That new number is going to be found by taking half of 6, which is negative 3, and then squaring that number, which gives us 9. Okay, and then we have to remember to fix our balance, so I need to add a number over here as well. And that number can be found by taking the negative 2 here and multiplying it by the 9, and then adding the result over here. So negative 2 times 9 is negative 18, so if I add a negative 18, that's what I'll be putting over here. Okay? All right. Next step, then, is to simplify this side. So we have negative 25 over here. And on this side, we need to factor. Now, you can use the box method if you prefer, but I prefer the shortcut that I shared with you, which is that it always looks like this, and we just need to figure out the number that goes here by dividing the middle number in half. And then final step is to add the 25 on both sides of the equation. So we end up with the following as our final answer. There it is. So that's called changing to vertex form by completing the square. Take a look at our next question. For numbers 5 through 8, we're going to be using this equation here at the top. Now I know when I switch to the next question, that's going to disappear. So I'm going to, I'm going to rewrite it myself over here a little bit, just so I can remember it for the problem for this. Okay, so number five is different than numbers six through eight. Number five, I'm putting the number inside the parentheses. So, and what that means is, is you're plugging negative two in for x. So what that's going to look like then is the following. Got to remember your order of operations now. We do parentheses first. Then we do the power. So 0 to the second power is just 0. Then we do multiplication. And then the addition finally. So that's it. So that's number 5. And numbers 6 through 8 are a little bit different um, because they're written differently. You'll see what I mean. Clear out of here and take a look at 6. All right. Now, this one, notice that it says find x if f of x equals negative 12. That means instead of plugging in negative 12 for x, what you're going to do is you're going to set the equation equal to negative 12. And as a result, you're going to solve for x. I'm setting it equal to negative 12. All right? Now, in, the, in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to minus the 12 on both sides. First step, we're trying to solve for x. We want to get x by itself. So first thing we do is we get rid of the outside number. So by subtracting 12, I get negative 24. 
And then we're going to divide this 3 on both sides. Then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to take square root to cancel out that square, that power of 2. So the square root cancels out the 2. And don't forget that when you solve by taking a square root, you always get a plus and a minus. So now we have the following. Now this negative 8 can be simplified. Um, first of all, we, when we have a square root of a negative number, that's an imaginary number. So we're going to take the negative out and put an i there on the outside instead. We're also going to be breaking down our 8 and taking out whatever we can. So 8 is 2 times 2 times 2. So I could take a 2 out, which then we'll have the following. See why. The last thing we need to do is we need to move the 2 away from the x to the other side. Now that 2 that I'm moving to the other side, you cannot combine it with this thing at all. Um, this is an imaginary and square root number. And this negative 2 that I'm putting over here is neither one of those. So we're just going to put it in first, and then we'll put the plus and minus 2i root 2. A really common mistake that I see a lot of students make here is they, they try to combine this 2 with this 2. You just can't do that. Um, they're not, it's like they're not like terms, but I think of it that way. So this will be our final answer there for that one. Uh, let's take a look at another example. More of the same, really. Um, you don't have to watch 7 and 8 if you feel like you got that down pretty well. Um, but let's go ahead and do another one. So in this one, we are doing 24. So I'm going to set the equation equal to I'm going to minus 12 on both sides first, just like last time. Then I'm going to divide 3. Now this one does have a little bit of a difference. It's different because now when I take the square root, it's actually a nice square root. The square root of 4, plus and minus, is 2. So now I've got x plus 2 is equal to plus and minus 2 because the square root of 4 is a nice normal square root. Now, in this case, we're, we're going to go ahead and move the 2 over, and I'll still write it like this for now, but what makes this problem special is, is that whenever there's no square root, you actually can combine the numbers together. So what we have then is we really have two answers. We have negative 2 plus 2, and we also have negative 2 minus 2, which is going to be, in this case, 0. And in this case over here, negative 4. Okay, so whenever you don't, when, when you take the square root, if the square root goes away completely, you can actually just split it up into two problems and simplify from there. That, that one was a little bit different in that way. Let's look at one more here. This one says we want to set it equal to 0 this time. So, of course, step one is to minus the 12. Then we want to divide by 3. Then we want to take the square root. Don't forget your plus and minus. Now, this one's weird, okay? Well, first of all, we're going to take that negative out and put an i here instead, and we can take the square root of 4, so it's 2i. So now we have the following. x plus 2 is equal to plus and minus 2i. So 4 has a nice, neat square root, so we just get 2, but there is still that i there. So this time, whenever I move this 2 over, and we get this, we actually have to stop here because you're not going to be able to combine a real number with an imaginary number. So we are done at this point. Okay. So that is solving and evaluating with quadratics and vertex form. Um, now we're going to move into our talk about radicals. Now, when it comes to graphing radicals, 
Um, we talked about some steps you'll go through. Uh, let me go ahead and write out the formula here. Back up. Change. A out here. All right. So this is our general form here for a uh, square root graph. Now, uh, when you graph these, your starting point is what we'll call it. will be the H and the K once again, where the H changes its sign like it always does. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is we got to draw our little graph. Now, the way you do that is you have to look at the A and the B simultaneously. So I'm going to make like a little decision chart here. Um, if you have a positive A or a negative A, or if you have a positive B or a negative B, that will create four different possible outcomes. Now, if they're both positive, then your graph will start at its starting point, HK, and then from there it will go up like that. If the B is positive but the A is negative, then one, from its starting point it will go down and to the right. Um, the A number basically tells you whether it goes up or down. The B tells you whether it goes left or right. So a positive A means up, a negative A means down. Positive A means, or I'm sorry, positive B means right, negative B means left. So for this one, my graph is going up and left, so that would look like this. Um, up and left. For the last box over here, it's going down and left, so that would look like this. Okay, so that's basically what you're square root functions can end up looking like. So coming over here to number nine then, we have no k present, so I'm gonna go ahead and add a zero. And that means that my starting point, I'll call it SP, my starting point will be two comma zero. Remember that's my h, we change its sign, that's my k. Now you'll notice that there is no b, that, so we can assume the number in front of the x is a positive one, positive b, right? And my number in the front, the A value is negative. Since I have a positive B and a negative A, that's my shape where the starting point is 2, 0. So if I were to graph this, 2, 0 is right here. And if I connect this shape to that dot, it would look like that. Okay. Now, you could do the same thing um, with cube root function, just so you know. Actually, let me that. With a cube root function, you have a little 3 right here. And the steps are all exactly the same. It's just that with cube root functions, they have a mirror image on the other side. Okay, so if you, have, if you ever have a cube root function, the steps are exactly the same. It's just that You'll be um, having your graph have an extra little part to it. So let's take a look at this one here. This is a cube root function. So for this one, you'll notice that we have a k. We have a number outside the parentheses, but we don't have a number being subtracted from the x inside the parentheses. So if you wanted to write this with all the numbers present, it would look like this. And since we didn't have a B, I put a 1. And since we didn't have an H, I put a 0. So my vertex, or it's not my vertex, my starting point is 0, negative 2 for this one. Excuse me. Graph for a second there. So 0, negative 2 would be right here. Now my A is positive and so is my B. So when that happens, the graph looks like that and right, and then add the little tail on the other side. 
And that's it. Probably not much more to add, but I, I will do a few more problems. But if you um, want to watch those other examples, you're welcome to. More of these. One, I guess this one has a little detail that's different. They wrote it weird. Um, that negative three, they put it in a weird spot based on how we usually write it, that is. I'll put it back there. So that makes it a little bit easier to understand. Now, my starting point in this case is going to be negative one, negative three. Negative one, because we do the opposite of that number for the H, my K is negative three. My B is positive and so is my A. So we have this shape here. And this time it's not a cube root function, it's a square root. So since it's a square root, it's not going to have the, the pink part here. It'll just be the black shape. Okay. So let's go ahead and graph it. Have negative 1, negative 3 would be here. And we're using this shape. There it is. Graph of that one. One more, I believe, of graphing radical functions. The cube root function. So this one will include the tails. All right. So um, this one is missing a lot of numbers. We don't have the A in the front, so a missing A means it's a 1. Our b is negative 8. We don't have our h, so I'll go ahead and put 0 there. And we also don't have our k, so I'll put a 0 there. So my starting point will be 0, 0. I have a negative b and a positive a. Negative b, positive a, be that shape. My starting point is it. That's that. So that's graphing square roots and cube roots. I'll talk about solving a little bit here. Um, we're talking about three different types of situations of solving when you're dealing with solving uh, square root functions here. Um, so step one, just minus the 10 on both sides. That goes away. You want to get rid of your outside numbers first if you can. Now step two, to get rid of that square root, I'm going to square both sides. Because those are opposites and they cancel, right? That gives me 49. And then we just add 4 and we're good to go. That's it. So that's one situation. Let's take a look at another situation of solving these. Sometimes you have a square root on both sides. Now when that happens, you're just gonna start by squaring right away. And then after you do that, the square roots are gone. And you just solve it like you would solve any normal equation. Put your p's together. And then get the p by itself. And then our third scenario, um, you'll notice that there's v's on both sides, but there's not a square root on both sides. Now, when that happens, you're going to end up with a little bit of a more tricky equation to solve. Um, first of all, what you're going to do is you're going to, since I have just a square root over here, what we're going to do is we're going to square both sides to get rid of that square root. So I'm left with v squared is equal to negative 2 plus 3v. Okay. Now, this is a quadratic equation because we have a v squared and a v. So when that happens, we're going to move everything to one side. So I'm going to start by adding the 2 over here. Now, v squared and 2 are not like terms, so I'm not going to actually add them together. I'm just going to put them next to each other there. I'm not going to combine them. And then this guy here, I'm going to move the 3v over. And that's not a like term either with anything. So I'll just slip it right here in the middle. Now we have a 
quadratic equation in standard form. And what we learned last week about that is, is you can use the quadratic formula. You can also solve it by factoring. It doesn't really matter um, which way you go. I'm going to go ahead and do both ways, and then you can pick which one you like the most. But um, just know that sometimes factoring doesn't work. So for the quadratic formula, it's going to be x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 times a times c all over 2a. Now I'm doing a little bit of math in my head here. Um, I'm kind of hoping you guys remember enough about what we talked about last week to kind of follow loosely along with me here. Um, but basically we're going to end up with 4 divided by 2, which is 2, and 2 divided by 2, which is 1. So you get 2 and 1 if you use the quadratic formula approach. Um, the other way is to factor. So that's where you would do the box method on this thing. And then set each piece or each factor equal to 0. But either way, you still get 2 and 1. So they both work, but the problem is that factoring doesn't always work. Sometimes the quadratic equation that you get may not be factorable. I think, I think the ones on this worksheet probably will be, so you can try it, but either way is good. That's it for solving radical equations. Um, now we're going to talk about rational exponents. Okay, so first of all, for this one, since we have a power being raised to a power, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to distribute that. We're going to do 4 thirds times 6. So how do you multiply 4 thirds times 6? That's going to be 24 over 3. Top times top, bottom times bottom. So we end up with V to the 24 thirds power. And that can be reduced. 8. So there's our final answer. Nice. Just using power property there. Um, but sometimes you can get a little bit more involved. So in this case, we have two things inside the parentheses. I've got a 64 and an n squared. So when I distribute this in, we're going to do the half to each one of these. Now, don't be confused, though. This is 64 to the first power. And this is n squared, right? And what we're doing is we're going to multiply both of those powers by a half. So I'm going to multiply the half by the power of 2, and I'll multiply the half by the power of 1. Now, when you multiply 1 by a half, you're just going to get a half. If you multiply 2 by a half, you're going to get 1. Okay. So the variable's done. There's really nothing else to do with the n. But that 64, we can work on that. So something that you guys need to recall is that if you ever have a number being raised to a power that's a fraction, what that really means is, is that your number is being rooted with a root of the denominator b and powered by the top part, p. Okay? So this number goes inside the radical called the radicand. The bottom is your root and the top is your power. So in this case, we would rewrite this like this. Okay. Now, this is basically just asking you to find the square root of 64, which I assume most of you guys know already is 8, and it's to the first power. So 8 to the first power is just 8. So, we're... so what makes this problem a little bit different from the last one is that you still multiply the power in like we did in the last one, but since there's a number here, you actually are going to use this process to rewrite the power as a radical and then use what we know about radicals to simplify the number. Okay, there's that. I think we have another one to try out here. Um, notice on this one, there is no variable and we're not going to distribute, it's just one number anyway. So, um, but what we are going to do is we're going to jump right into the changing it into radical form. So my root is a 3. My radicand is the 343, and we're raising this to the negative 2 power. So the first 
first thing I want to do is I want to find the cube root of 343. Um, so I got to break down 343. That's not fun. Let's go ahead and do that. I think three goes in there. One. No, it doesn't. Darn it. What goes into 343? That's an ugly number. I don't think, I know two doesn't. Three obviously doesn't. Four. I wonder if four goes in there. I No, four won't go in there. Let's try seven. Seven goes into 34. Um, four times? Okay. Leaving two plus is 63, so that would be nine. Aha, there it is. So, um, 343 breaks down into seven times seven times seven. And since we're looking for a cube root, we need groups of three. So I have three sevens. We can take the seven out and drop that off. So the answer is just basically seven. So the cube root of 343 is seven. Now, seven to the negative two power. Well, seven to the second power is 49, right? But what does that negative do? In case you guys forgot, it takes your answer, which is 49, and it makes it a reciprocal. So 149 as a result. Take a look at another one here. All right. So once again, we're going to jump right off the bat. And we're going to change this into a fourth root of 10,000. And we're raising that to the negative 5 power. So what number multiplied by itself four times would give you 10,000? The answer is 10. Now we're raising that to the power of negative 5. Well, 10 to the 5th power is just a 1 with 5 zeros. That's easy. It's 100,000. But since it's negative 5, it's a reciprocal. So it's 1 100,000. That's the end of our little worksheet. So more to come next week, guys. Hope you're doing well. Talk to you later.